Welcome back to the Fearless Future Podcast. We are your hosts, Glenn. And Amber. And today we're going to talk to you about what the big gurus online are not telling you about wholesaling. Oh boy, let's go. You know, we have done over 1,156 deals now and counting. <laughs> and out of those, I think probably between six and 700 have been wholesale deals. Yeah. Millions and millions of dollars in wholesale deals. And so we know what we're talking about when it comes to wholesale. Just a thing or two. Yeah. And I think that we have to dive into what wholesale is first, but I think that people need to understand um, it's, I think I want to start by saying it's not as easy as they make it seem online. I hope that we don't make it seem easy. It is, it's work. It's very worth it and very, very lucrative, lucrative, but it's not a plug and play thing. Right. You're going to have to get good at a couple of skills. And I want to talk to you about that today because I think that, you know, we're obviously very transparent. We want people to understand that there's, there's a lot of money to be made in different areas of real estate, but you have to know what you get into. Right. You have to know what your skill set is and how you can do this and, and all that. So let's tell them what a wholesale is. You want to dive in or you want me to? Yeah. So I like to think of wholesaling as matchmaking. You're, you're finding a house and putting it under contract. You're a woman. You're, you, you would like to think of it as matchmaking. Uh, why but not? You, it's, but you're right. But, you're right. It, but it's, it's a fun way to you're think about it. You're such a girl. <laughs> of course I am. And aren't you glad I'm a girl? I, very much. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I think of like Will Smith and one of my favorite movies, Hitch. You know, he got paid a very large sum of money to make opportunities happen. That was oh. how he worded it in the movie. How interesting. I make opportunities happen. And yeah. so so you you find a house. You usually as a, a distressed seller that, you know, somebody that wants to get out of the house. It's yep. not easily sellable. So you put the house under contract, but you don't actually buy it. And you're very upfront with that person to let them well, know not, that- not everybody is. Right. We'll, that, talk, we'll talk about that I'm in a minute. I'm saying the right way to do it. The, Correct. The, um, How we do it. The honest and the way to do it with integrity- Correct. Is you let the person know what you're doing. You don't try to scam Correct. them and tell them that you're going to buy it and have contractors. Right. So you buy that, you put the house under contract and then you go out and you find an end buyer. And let's say you put the contract, your house under contract for $50,000. And then you find a buyer that's going to pay $75,000 for it. You keep that $25,000 spread that's in the middle. That's what yes. you get for your wholesale fee. Let's talk about who the players are in a wholesale deal. Kind of break it down for a minute. So you have a seller. Then, of course, you have the wholesaler in the middle, like you said. Then you have a buyer at the end. But you're also going to have a title company or an attorney that will help you in the process. And you may even have a real estate agent that brings you a buyer after you have it under contract. Right. So there's, a, there's, a several, there's several people that you'll be in business with. And if the seller is in an estate situation, you're also in business with all the heirs. Yep. So you're gonna have to deal with all the family and all siblings. those people, siblings, yep. and there's always one sibling who's broke and needs all the money for themselves. And they wanna negotiate for a ridiculous price. That's always how that works. Again, it's harder than a lot of people make it seem. And it's a great income stream for us, it's millions of dollars, but you have to get good at two things. You know there? Look at your notes. You'll be able to see. I don't know what fuh means, but I feel like that's not the right way to start a sentence. I don't know what that was exactly, but I feel like that's not what I wanted to hear. So I'll answer my own question. So it's off. You want to go find off market deals and get. That's great. what I was going to say. The fuh was finding deals. Yeah, I don't know because fuh sounded like that was going a whole different direction. I don't know if this is a family friendly podcast, sweetheart. So I don't know if fuh was the way to start a sentence. So anywho, continue along. So what's the second thing? So off, finding off market deals. Uh, negotiating, which we just talked about. Yep. And then there's the art of managing the deal. Right. So start to finish. So I think we should take people back to kind of how we got started because there's a lot of people that do wholesaling as a, that's all they do. They yeah. just wholesale properties. And just because something's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Of course not. You no. know, th this is just like anything though. Like once you build the system and get all those key players, it it is very systematic. It is. So I think we should talk about how we did it because right now a lot of people- You are, mean by accident? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people, that's all they do. Their whole business is based on a wholesale model. They never actually own any real estate. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a job. Don't kid yourself. When, you're, when, you're, when you are doing, it's not really an investor. You know, it kind of is. It's the, it's the entry point. You're in the point. real estate world. You're in the world. You're, you're kind of like an agent, but you get paid a whole lot more because you're negotiating um, prices to buy. And then you're selling that contract to somebody else that wants to buy right. it, right? Usually much bigger spreads. You, than, than a real estate agent would get, Correct. for sure. And so they don't, there's also no licensing required in right. most states to do this. There may be in the future, that may be something that happens, but right now there's no licensing required for it. So I think that people should understand that, that again, you can make a living doing this, but if you're doing this or you're doing flipping, 
if you're if you wholesale or you flip, you have a job. Right. They're very and, high paying jobs. Every time you're done with that house, you're out of a job. You work yourself out of a job and you have to go find a new one. Right. So we always encourage everybody that works with us to use that money to buy rentals or when you find off market deals, turn them in, turn a couple into rentals because that's where your wealth is built. Right. Right. Wealth is built there. You can make money now, but if you don't do anything with that money besides spend it, it's just going to be money. So And and that's the reason why in our business, it, it's really important to know all of this stuff too, because each house um, has may have a different exit strategy. Correct. Also, depending on where your business is at, you you know, cash flow cycle and all that stuff. So, yeah. so having these different exit strategies, whether that be rentals or flipping or wholesaling, is a really good thing. The two the two deals that we did back in the day that really changed everything from my perspective was we bought that house in Rotterdam, and if you remember, we were under contract to buy the house, and we got a phone call from Elena, and she called and said. Um, hey, I understand that you have that house under contract, like a neighbor had told her. And we said, uh, yeah. And she said, I'd like to buy it from you. And I said, well, we haven't, we haven't closed on it yet. And she said, yeah, I could just, I'll just take over and be the buyer. And I said, what? And she said, well, I'll give you $5,000 to do that. And I said, well, if you're going to give me five, maybe I'll take 15. You started negotiating. Started negotiating, right? And so I said, okay, 15. And I was thinking to myself, well, I was going to flip it and make 30. So if I could make 10 or 15 without ever touching the house, that's an interesting concept to me. So the first question I would have if I was listening was, why would you do that when you could make 30 if you flipped it versus taking 15? And the reason for that is because you can take that same money that we were going to use to flip that house and churn it and burn it much more quickly and turn that in, over into another property. Right. So we made 15 really quick right. without having to do the work and then use that money again. You also minimize your risk, right? right. So if you do a do a, a flip, you might find a problem on that house that might be a $10,000 problem. You may have a septic problem or a sewer or a tree's growing through your sewer system you don't know about. You may have a problem. You find this five or 10 grand and before you know it, that potential 30,000 profit is now 15. Mm -hmm. And you did all that work for 15 for six months to get that house ready for the market. Right. And here you are, you could have just sold a piece of paper for 15. And make so, all that money without doing the work. Right. And so that that's what you want to look at. As a real estate investor, you have to ask yourself, how can I make the most amount of money fast, fastest on this deal? Correct. Right. So, okay. So now we we offered, we ended up settling for like $12,000 for this house or something like that. She paid us like 12 grand to buy the contract from us. And we realized that that's an interesting way of doing business. And then we didn't do it again for a little bit because we're like, that was a that was an anomaly. Now, this is back before it was popular. Right. Right. Nobody, nobody. Wholesaling wasn't even really a term then. No, nobody was even doing it back then. Yeah. So we, we did our first one and thought, huh. So it was about a year later that I, we got a phone call from, we had a guy working for us. We had a phone call from someone that said, I have a house that I want a dollar for. And it was in the hood. And they said, I want a dollar for this house. It was, uh, it was full of um, like. I don't know, a lot of junk, like nasty, smelly, rotten food, rotten stuff. There was even a couple of carcasses of animals in there that were dead yeah, raccoons. The guy that was that was, was working for us called you and said, they said they wanted a dollar. How much should I offer him? He said, should I offer him a thousand? I said, you're like, offer him a dollar. He said, that's yeah, what they asked for. The guy asked for a dollar. Give him a dollar. And we should do a <laughs> side note that the reason he wanted a dollar was because he was paying $5,000 a year in taxes. And he wanted, he said, I can't, I'm just losing money on this house. Just give me a dollar. And the house take, was in the hood. Like, it was not a, yeah. not a good house. So we put the house under contract for a dollar while we had it under contract. I got permission to go in the house and I paid somebody 400 bucks to go in and clean, it, clean out. it out. They cleaned all the crap out of there and just cleaned it out. So at least it was a shell. They yeah. could at least look at it. A graffiti covered shell, but a yes, shell nonetheless. Yes. And then I, Without the dead carcasses. I remember putting it on the market and making some phone calls and a gentleman called me and said, um, I'll buy it from you. And I was asking 10 grand and he said, I'll give you five grand. And I said, sold. And I remember going to his house. It was, it was on a, um, uh, it was a holiday, holiday yeah. it was a holiday Eve. I want to say it was Christmas I Eve. I do too, for some reason. But I don't know if it was Christmas Eve, but I always do my charity work on Christmas Eve, but it may have been that night. But I remember sitting in the house. They were, they were ethnic. It was very strong, potent, like scent. They're making all this kind of food. I'm like, wow, it's not my kind of food, but I was whatever. And the guy, the guy wrote me a check for $5,000 and I sold him that contract right there. And I remember thinking, okay, I just made $4,500 clear on this deal. Now I did a little bit of work on it because I actually cleaned it out, yeah. but I never owned the house. Right. I actually sold that contract off to somebody else without ever taking title. So I never had to pay tax on it. I like how you're saying I during this whole conversation, like I wasn't even there. No, I know. We, we, but 
Yeah, I don't remember you being in the crappy house with me. I don't. Uh, oh, I, I totally say that. was That's in true. that house. That's true. That's true. You were. Yeah, that was it was nasty. I do remember that. So, so that gets back to the wholesale. Can we be done with that? What a bad uh, communicator I am by saying <laughs> I. I don't. Sorry about that. We, 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 we. So, on a wholesale deal, um, again, what they're not telling you is, is that it's it's not as easy as you think because you have to go find the deals. Right. And I think people think you're going to find deals every day of the week. And if you don't have the right software and you don't have the right systems in place to look for deals, and you have to have a continual flow of deals, you can't. Let's talk about how much you can make on, but, on a deal. But that's true. You have to go find the deals, whether you're wholesaling or flipping. Correct. The, the, that doesn't change. Right. That's true. And I also think that when you are searching for. Um, it's a different style of negotiation, though. Well, you're still you're still trying to get the best deal. But but you do have to when you're wholesaling the house, you do have to get the seller to agree to let you try to find the buyer. So, so, okay, let's talk about that. There's a, there's a dishonest way, I think, to do it, which is what people did Agreed. for years. They would come in, they would say, I'm buying your house, and people still do it. I'm buying your house today for $100,000 in cash. Great. They sign a contract, and they have a contract. Now, they put all kinds of contingencies in the contract saying they can go out and they have to do this inspection, that inspection, whatever it might be. And they run mm -hmm. out for 30 days and they try and find a cash buyer who will buy that contract from them. But then they go to the person, they'll, they'll traipse them through the house of the owner and they'll say, which are really contractors usually, mm -hmm. or, or other, other, no, I'm sorry. They're usually other investors that they're trying to sell the house yes. to, but they say, oh, this is my contractor that's do you trying remember, to look at the house. Do you remember the one house we got taken through and the guy was a wholesaler? Yeah. And he said, if the owner asks, you're, you're a contract contractor. contractor. And, I, and I looked at him and said, I ain't playing that game. I'm not playing that game. I said, I won't say anything, but don't introduce me as yeah. anybody. I don't, said, because yeah, I'm not going to lie. I said, I'm on TV for goodness sake. I'm people know who I am. Yeah. I, so I said, introduce, and, and plus that just goes against I our said, core values. Inter introduce me as your partner. Yeah. That's partner's fine, yeah. but don't introduce me as your contractor. Cause yeah. that, that's not true. Right. So, so we went, you know, we went through that house. I don't, I don't know if we ended up buying that house I or not, know. but, but that's the, that's the not scrupulous way of doing it. Right. Is you go in and. You um, pretend that people are coming through that are your contractor trying to give you bids right. when they're really people you're trying to sell the house right. to. So then if you don't come up with a buyer, you just cancel the contract and walk away, which is not good for the seller. That gives that gives everybody in our industry a bad name. Right. So here's what we do. When our team meets somebody that is a house we're going to wholesale, we were very upfront. We say, look, at, we have a few different options. Our contract states that we might buy this house ourselves and do a full renovation. We may partner with somebody like one of our students or somebody in the industry that, that might be doing this. We might partner with somebody to do this deal, or we may sell it off to another investor in our network. We have the largest network in the capital region, and we may do that. So one of those three options is our exit plan. Sometimes they say, no, I want you to buy it. I don't want anybody else involved. It's rare, but sometimes they do. But it's great to have a contract that allows you to have- And we have a time frame that we give them to do that in. Yes, we give them a closing date of 30 days right. and we communicate the whole way through so they know what we're doing. So if you let them know what you're doing up front, then it makes it so like everybody understands, okay, I'm going to go out and find a buyer from my list of buyers that mm -hmm. you don't have access to. Right. Because I have a huge list of cash buyers that might want to buy a house like this. And for me, what made me start doing wholesaling early on was that I said, you know, we were marketing spending at the time, I think we spent 50 grand a month now on marketing, but we were spending maybe five grand a month at, at marketing. And the phone was ringing. And every time a house came in in an area we didn't like, we said no. Right. Oh, it's in downtown Schenectady? No, thank you. Oh, it's in the hood? No, no, thank you. What I didn't realize was people want to buy those houses. Yep. So why not take those leads and turn them into money? And, and, and help the seller in the process. And for us. Because real estate, let's, let's be real honest right now. Real estate agents don't want anything to do with those houses. Because, I wouldn't if I was Because an there's not enough commission on them. Because if they sell a house for $20,000, it's the same amount of work as if they sell a house for $300,000, but the commission is not the same. Yeah. So where do you think your real estate agent is going to spend their time? Yeah. So the reason people, you know, if there's people listening going, well, why would people do that versus just, you know, trying to sell it on the MLS? That's why. Yeah. I think it's important people understand that, that whole thing. So, so let's talk about more about why, why kind of what's, what's some challenging things about doing wholesaling. We average around $20,000 a spread for wholesales. We've had wholesales as high as 78000 do you remember the story about our office building? Mm, remember that? Uh -huh. So we bought our office building in New York from a wholesaler for like oh, yeah. 40 grand yeah, yeah, yeah. years ago. That was I forget how many, 10 years ago, at least. And he came to our open house after we finished this. We made this ugly house to a beautiful office, right? And same office we have today. He came to our open house and said, did you hear what I did? I said, no. 
He actually put a house under contract yep. and then CVS decided to buy the whole block. Yes. And his wholesale fee was 200 grand on that one deal. We had looked at that house before. Remember it had the weird columns on yes. the front? Yes. And we did look at it and yeah. didn't buy it, but he put it under contract. He made 200,000 on a wholesale split. On one so, deal. so commercial deals can have wholesales as well. That's big numbers. That's yep. big numbers you can go after. Now, do those deals happen every day? No. no. Do regular wholesales for 20 grand happen every day? No, they do for us, but because we have a system in place. But for the average person, I think that we have to make sure they understand that you're dealing with people that have put themselves in very difficult situations. Now, maybe life put them in difficult situations, but a lot of times it's them. It's bad choices. They've made bad choices. They're behind on their bills. They didn't pay this. They didn't pay that. Instead of paying their bills, they decided to spend it on vacations or lottery tickets or whatever weed or yeah. whatever, right? They, they've, they've put their money someplace else and they have not paid their bills or their taxes or whatever. So now they've got undue pressure. So the person that you deal with a lot, not all the time, but a lot of times they are difficult people to deal with. Right. Why does it make a difference? Because they'll change their mind six times during the, during the conversation. They'll sign a contract and then tell you someone else is going to give them more so they want to back out, which we have to make sure it's very clear we're not going to let you back out, right? We have to make sure we, they understand so that. So I think we should pause right a minute and talk okay. about that. Okay. You know, how do you protect yourself from, because if they're calling you, yeah. they're probably calling other investors too. Sure. And how do we protect ourselves from other people coming in and stealing our wholesale? Well, number one, we have a contract on the house. Number one, when we, when we come in and put a house under contract, we have a contract on the house. That's really the only protection you can get. End of the day, it's whatever can be enforced in a court, right? And a lot of courts aren't going to side with the seller. So the best thing you can do is build a great relationship with the seller. Yep. The best thing you can do is to just build that relationship and that, let them know that you're here to help them. Whoever else talks to them, like they're always to send anybody that calls them to you. Say, I've already, I already have someone handling it for me. Talk to this, this, he's a representative. Send it over to Glenn. Not, I don't do that anymore, but you know yeah. what I mean? So our, but our, but our team does. So um, next thing is when you're dealing with those people that have difficult situations, clearing title. Clearing title means when you buy a house, you want to have a clean title on the house. That's what we call it in New York. It could be a deed, but a uh, deed or state or a title state. It means you don't want to have any other liens or lawsuits or mostly it's liens that are on that, on that house. So if you had a judgment, for instance, you didn't pay a bill for $25,000, they could attach that to your asset, to your real estate. And then whoever owns that house, if that's not cleared first, that becomes your debt. It's on the property. Okay. So you're stuck with it. You want to make sure that your deed is clean. That's really important. Now, clearing title, the title company does for you. You don't have to do that. But this is part of, this is part of the deal management. Our team spends a lot of time. We have a transaction coordinator, full-time transaction coordinator. Her job is to make sure that everybody is moving along. Because right now the attorney clears title. If you're in a title state, the title company will clear title. They, let's say that you bought a house. Uh, let's say that, that there was a mortgage on that house from 20 years ago. It was paid off, but the bank never filed their payoff. So now it shows as an outstanding mortgage. But guess what? That bank shut out. They went out of business. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you lose, you, you have to track down all the paperwork and there's, there's certain paperwork that lawyers can do to make sure that you have your, um, your clear title. So it's a process. And then you may have to find heirs. You may have to find heirs that want nothing to do with the house. They're estranged. They want nothing to do with it. And so you may have to dig around and find those people to figure out how to get them to sign off because it might be their property that they own now. Right. Let me tell you about Tampa, the house we have in Tampa. So we have this house in Tampa that we're trying to close. We've had it for several months. It's a $36,000 wholesale spread. That's what we call it, the wholesale spread. That means that we'll, we'll net $36,000 profit on this when it's all said and done, minus some fees, so maybe a little bit less. A friend of ours in New York called us. She used to work for us and said, hey, I got this friend who wants to sell a house. Her husband died, and she, it's, it's run down. She's not in it. She wants to get out. Great. We sent a guy over Tampa put the house under contract, sold it right away, made this great spread. This is awesome. We're going to close right away. Shows up on title. Turns out she can't sell it. Legally speaking, he never had her on the title of the house. He never had her on the deed. So she, they, were, they were married for 35 years, and he had two daughters he had adopted many years ago. She never knew them. They were estranged. Never knew them. Wow. And so they're not, they don't stand to make any money on the house because it's going into tax foreclosure. There's no, there's no room on it besides what we're paying for the house. 
So there's no extra room for the seller. They just wanted to get out. The contract says they just want to get out for what they owe on the house. Okay. So what's the incentive for those girls, the, the two daughters to sell? They don't care. They don't care. Our team had connections in the military. I'm not going to tell you all the names, but our connection had teams in the military. They did a background check and found out who these daughters' names were somehow. And they found the daughters' names, and then our team went and found them on Facebook. And they messaged them. They didn't get back to them. But all of a sudden, they did. Social media pays off. Yes. So they found that this has taken several months, but they finally got a hold of them. And they've agreed, apparently, last I heard, they've agreed to sign the documents. And there's a little more to do because it's not quite that simple because they owe a lot of back taxes and that kind of stuff. But they've agreed to be part of the process. We may have to give them a thousand bucks each or something. But the, the deal never stops going. Yeah. It, and it ain't over till it's over. You've got to see that all the way through and not. That's the deal one, management part. It is the deal management part. And it's, you know. You're dealing with personalities. You're dealing with people that are in hardships. You're dealing with, you know, sometimes some mental health. <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of, you know, Meg, I remember went in that house one time and the woman. Yes, with, I was thinking the same thing. Didn't have her pants on. And she was on the ground and didn't have any pants on. Yeah. Right. And she, she went to do a wellness a check wellness on her. A wellness check. Yeah. Because she, she wasn't they, answering her phone. And so our team went and did a wellness yeah. check to say, listen, because they're supposed to close. They're supposed to close. Meg wound up having to have um, a traveling notary go there and get all the documents signed so we can right. close the house. So you have to think outside the box so, as a wholesaler. people can't get out of their own way. Yeah. You don't just make a deal and then walk away from it is my point. Right. You make a deal and then you have to stick it out and stay the whole way through that deal. I'm thinking about the house. It's, that, it's like being a matchmaker, but also counseling. It's a lot of counseling. Not Therapy. Yeah. They're, they're very, they're very complicated situations and you, you should be prepared too. If you're an investor, let me tell you about the deal we have in Schenectady right now. I think it's on Avenue B and we had like a $35,000 wholesale spread prepared on this deal. The, her ex-husband won't move out, won't take any phone calls, won't move out. So now we have the house under contract. We have a buyer for this house. The buyer's a cash buyer, but the buyer finally, after six months, says, I can't wait anymore. If that tenant's not out of there, I'm not going to buy the house. Yeah. If he won't get out for you, I have to deal with him. And in your state, right. it's that a pain. Months, yeah. It is. So our team decided to buy the house ourselves. So keep that in mind. We have a house under contract for wholesale. We have a buyer. They have closing comes. He won't buy the house because that tenant won't move out and he won't answer anybody's phone calls. Still to this day, he hasn't answered phone calls. We buy the house. So we close on it ourselves. So now it's our problem. So we but the ex-wife didn't want to evict him? If she answers the phone. She lies where she is, what she's doing. She lies about this day. I'll be there. I'll sign papers. Doesn't show up. This goes on and on okay. and on. It's, it's like insanity. It was really hard to get her to sell the house in the first place. So she sells it. Now she's out. So now this guy's our problem. We offer him cash for keys. Cash for keys means we offered him, I think, $1,000 to move out. Then we up to $2,000. He will not take our phone call because in New York State, which this is why it sucks having tenants in New York State, they know that they can sit for six months and not pay rent and the government will protect them all day long. Yep. They could destroy the house. They could grow crack in there. They could have fighting dogs and they could be... Human trafficking. And it just wouldn't matter. In New York State, they're like, you know what? You're okay. We don't oh, want to... you're running a meth lab. Yeah. That's all right. We don't want to offend you in New York State. You get to stay there. Let the big bad landlord take the brunt of that. They don't care. So this guy has been in that house. We've owned it for over six months. We've had the eviction process going for over six months. We finally almost got him because what I heard was he gave a piece of paper saying that I paid for six months rent in advance and the ex-wife signed it and said, yes, he did. And that got passed to signature home buyers. And we said, absolutely not. <laughs> So what, what it looks like is that he forged her name. Yeah. So now they, have a, now they have a special hearing at court for him to prove that signature. And they believe that they, they said, because Meg said, I have her signature on the closing documents. This is nothing like it. Yeah. So now if the judge determines it's fraud, he'll have to move out. So he moves out. Now we're going to fix the house up and sell it ourselves and probably make fifty or $60,000 on the deal ourselves. So long story to say that we had a wholesale, but it turned into a buy. Because we are prepared to right. make that deal. If you don't have any cash, you don't know how to do it. You'd have to, number one, try and find a buyer that was okay taking on that risk of a tenant. Or you have to back out of the deal. Yeah. Right? And it's a pain in the butt. So these are things that happen when you're wholesaling houses that you don't hear about. And they're common. They're not every deal. But I would say 
I have to ask Meg, I would be willing to bet probably 30% of all wholesale deals go through very smooth Mm -hmm. and 70 are choppy. They need Maybe maybe 50 are choppy and 20 are really choppy. They need deal management. I I think we kind of glazed over this too, but we really didn't go into detail on it. Um, And I'm going to give another, another TV analogy here. So another really important piece of the puzzle, if you are wholesaling houses, is you have to have a lot of end buyers. You have to have a lot of other investors mm, on your good list. Point, good point. And, and the, the analogy I want to make is like, you know, if you're on The Bachelor, there's, there's one bachelor or bachelorette, but then there's a lot of contestants. So, yeah. so the house that you have under contract is, is The Bachelor, but then you want to have people lined up out the door right. to, to hook up with that house. All right. Let's talk about why somebody would actually want to buy a property from a wholesaler. Right. I don't think that people, people always say to themselves, why would somebody pay you $20,000 over what you paid for the house? Because the numbers still work. Right. So let's say, for instance, you negotiate a house that you want to buy for um, $100,000 and you stand to make a profit of $70,000 in that house, but you just want to wholesale it. So you sell that house to somebody else for one twenty. dollars now that new person, they stand to make a $50,000 profit. They're fine with that. Yeah, it's still a win-win for everybody. Right. They don't mind that you made $20,000 for selling them the contract. Right. Plus, they didn't have to do the marketing to find that off-market right. deal anyway. So, right. So there's a cost to that too. There's a cost to market. And if the wholesaler is doing the marketing, you know, you're just... When we first started wholesaling, people didn't understand. Like, I don't, you're making money. You're just marketing stuff up. I go... Don't forget, I spend thirty thousand to forty thousand dollars a month to, to find these deals. Right. So I have a business that I run that finds deals that you can't find. Yeah, every lead costs money. Right, and so as a wholesaler, you're finding deals that other people can't find, can't or don't want to. It's a lot of work. Yeah, right. So that's my deal is to get that thing, and then I'm going to see it through to closing. Right. I'm going to make sure title's clear. I'm going to make sure it's all set. Make sure all the players are in place. And, and there, I get paid for my fee and my service. Now, my fee might be 5000 It might be 100000 mm-hmm. It really just depends. Again, the average is around $20,000 in our city. Some cities are thirty dollars or 40000 If you're in California, it might be eighty dollars to $100,000 because the price of houses is so much higher. Right. But if it's a win-win, if, if you find the contract, you mark it up, $10,000, $20,000, whatever it is, and it's, w- it's what they're willing to pay you. Right. They can negotiate. Right. And you can say yes or no. Right. But if you have multiple buyers... That's what you want to do. And I'll tell you this too. Because then they start competing with each other. You would do better off to do what I call reverse wholesaling. Reverse wholesaling means instead of finding the property and then trying to find the end buyer, another investor, start building your list of buyers now. You find out someone like me. Who's the biggest buyer in your area? Find two or three of them and say, what is your specialty? Yeah, what's your buy box? What do you like? Where do you like to buy? And you find out what they want, drill down on your marketing. Then you go out and spend time in those neighborhoods and you find those find deals. Find them what they want. Yes. Feed the hungry beast. And then you just say to them, hey, I have a deal for you. I won't, I won't put it off to anybody else. Here's, here's the deal. And by the way. I'll you, give you first dibs. You don't have to share how much you're making on the house. I right. want you to understand that. Some people do. We don't. So if we have a house, again, if we put a house in your contract for $100,000, if we think we can get one forty for that house, we ask 140 mm-hmm. and our contract says this, this contract with this house is $140,000. That's what it is. They won't know till the closing table what we're making. Right. And it's none of their business. Nope. Because if the numbers work, the numbers work. So I think it's really important people understand yeah. that. Going We've forward. even bought wholesales from other people. Of course we have. Yeah. So and flip them and it works. Yeah. So it's just about who finds the deal first. Right. So look, let's wrap this up. I want people to just understand that there are three things you have to be very good at to be a successful wholesaler, even part-time. And remember, you can make $10,000 a month doing this. Do one deal a month and make 10 grand a month. Yeah. You, it's a great living if you want it, to do it's it. It's a fantastic side hustle. Oh, fantastic side hustle for sure. And then you'll, you'll also be able to sniff out the best deals if you want to keep a rental or you want to do a renovation for yeah. yourself. And it's, and, you it's a good, that too. and it's a good introduction to getting involved in real estate investing. And it, te- like you said, it teaches you how to find the deals. And it's a good way for people yeah. that may not have a lot of money or good credit. Exactly. Because this doesn't require either one of those. That's very true. That's, yeah. a, that's a great point. You never actually own the house and you use the, you use the end buyer's money, not your money. Right. So there's a lot to that. So you have to be good at finding off-market deals. You have to have a consistent system with consistent leads coming in, direct mail, online, you know, driving for dollars, whatever that might be. You have to be consistent about finding off-market deals if you want to have a business that's a wholesale business. Next, you want to be great at negotiations because yeah. you got to buy low. 
if you buy low enough, there's always money in the deal for you. But if you don't buy low enough, then there's not enough room for another investor to flip it and make money. Right. So you got to buy low. And the third most important thing is the art of deal management. You have got to be good and patient and understanding and be a problem solver to get through some of the craziness these people have created in their own lives. Yes. And deal with some of the crazies out there because, you know, if this were easy, everybody would do it. Right. And I will close with this. Wholesaling is a fantastic living. Our company will probably do around $2 million in spreads, profits this year from wholesales only. Now, again, we have marketing costs and whatnot to back it out, but $2 million in wholesale spreads this year. And it's not always easy, but it's worth it. 100%. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure you click that like button and don't miss anything coming out. So turn on those notifications and subscribe to our channel.